Holy Gospel according to Matthew. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to take over the leadership of ELCA from presiding Bishop uh, Eaton, but we are going to start now just by a vote. <laughs> and, well, I notice you don't have cards and you don't have uh, the voting machine, but we are going to vote. Are you ready? And this is the vote. We are going to decide how many sheep are here and how many goats are here. <laughs> yeah, we are church. <laughs> and we can say this again and again. And we are Lutheran too, just as the presiding bishop said a few minutes ago. Saved by grace and cleansed in the water of baptism marked forever. But we are confronted here by a text and there is something that bothers me in this text. It talks about, the whole text talks about judgment, separation, and curse. I don't think the writer was a Lutheran. <laughs> because the text seems to give criteria for determining who is sheep and who is goat. And it's simple. Feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, care for the sick, Visit the prisoner. So it's like we can walk through a checklist, and that's all that is required of us in order to determine whether we are sheep or goat. But as you know, friends, the faith we hold is not just about a checklist to determine whether we are sheep or goat, whether we belong to those who care for the least of these or not. And I guess you may even find yourself on both sides. I often do. Each of us most probably experienced times when we fed, clothed, visited, cared for one of the least of these. But there are also times when we probably just drove past by and looked away from one of the least. Someone holding his or her hands to us, hoping for a miracle to happen, and we walk past by. 
Sometimes we don't even see that person because we are so wrapped up in our lives and our own issues. Sometimes it is just too hard to see. For example, I don't like seeing the images of little children starving and dying in refugee camps. As soon as the TV puts that on my face, I just don't like it. I don't know about you. Therefore, I would like that we read this text not as a scare to do good works in order to be sheep to the right of Jesus the King Judge, but as a text that speaks to our identity as disciples of Jesus and how we live out that identity in the world. And it is not about right theology or right doctrine, as sometimes we get ourselves entangled in fighting about the right doctrine and the right theology. It is not the basis for the judgment, at least not in this text that we just read. It is a question how we live our baptismal identity in a world where there is so much fear and distrust, where the stranger is no longer easily welcome. More and more walls of separation are erected based on gender, ethnicity, race, name it, at a time when we think that the human race has developed so much that the next level is that we migrate from this earth, all of us, to the moon or somewhere in the sky. In my travels as LWF president, I listen to the debates in churches, and it is all a mix of compassion and hospitality on one hand, but fear, suspicion, and hesitance on the other hand. And we miss out the opportunity to listen to the cry of the least of these, because we are caught in our own debates. So like the man in the parable of Jesus beaten by bandits between Jerusalem and Jericho, it is so easy to quickly maneuver our way around or keep our distance from those needing love and care. Our religiosity or cultural beliefs tend to stand on the way. Nations and communities have different reasons for closing their doors against the stranger and those who are different. But scripture is unambiguous that all, all are created in God's divine image and are worth the love of Christ who died for all. And it is interesting that the UN Agenda 2030 speaks about not leaving anyone behind. We are church. We have no alternative to being the hands of God. We have a calling to see the face of Christ in those unfamiliar places. And you know what? The world also sees Christ in our faces, in our decisions, in our actions, and in our deeds. Some months ago, the mission director of my church visited some rural communities, and he was surprised to discover, or, well, to find out a community that we thought um, it's a Muslim community. But he found out actually there is no specific religious practice in that, com that community. And one of them said, you know, another Jesus was also here. That is to say, there was a time when somebody came here in the name of Christ. We 
We saw him, we tested him, we walked with him, but he disappeared. So we are glad another Jesus is back. For so, for so, for, so for some people, you, you and I are Jesus. Listen again to Jesus' words. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. These words call us even beyond works of charity, which is not an exclusive mark of the church. For today there are millions of NGOs throughout the world doing works of mercy, sometimes even better than the church. I feel many of the issues that we are dealing with today are beyond simple works of mercy. Some of them are beyond distribution of bread. Dear friends, the words of Jesus in this text call the church to radical disobedience to systems, cultures, theologies, attitudes, mindsets, and forces that dehumanize and reduce other human beings to nothing. It is our essential nature as body of Christ to engage in prophetic actions of defiance and seek to interrupt to interrupt a world of indifference to the plights of the least of these. Visiting Christ, giving water to Christ, caring for Christ who is sick is more than being politically correct, particularly at a time when there is so much power play, corruption, hate, blatant injustice, and any action that denigrate fellow human beings. Especially when the least of these are at risk. It is not always easy, and I can tell you from my context that being prophetic is not always easy. It is easier said than done because it is about carrying the cross. It is about standing before powers. It is about challenging those who think that they have it all. It's not easy. But we don't have a choice. We don't have an alternative. In one of his sermons, Martin Luther says, where one Christian does not serve the other, God does not abide there. And that is also not Christian. So if we cannot serve one another, and we cannot stand for one another, and we cannot voice out, then according to my Martin Luther, God does not abide in our midst. Now, we may not always know if we are making a difference in the world. And this is the tricky part. Some of our deeds of kindness may never be noticed. Some may not even be appreciated. Some may even be opposed. But one of our actions, but none of our actions goes unnoticed in the sight of Christ who calls us. Dear church, we are facing challenges many like never before. But with Christ at the center and being led by the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity to open the channels of life in abundance, to open the channels of generosity, to open the channels of justice, and refuse to give up in the face of the world 
that constantly chooses to block and close those channels. Therefore, in the words of prophet Isaiah, do not hold back. Do not hold back love and care for the neighbor. Do not hold back love for friends and enemies as well. Do not hold back love for those familiar and not familiar. Do not hold back from being the voice of justice, peace, and reconciliation. Do not hold back from speaking the truth and from calling evil for what it is. Cry out and do not hold back from speaking love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. And here is the good news. That Christ himself is very present in our witness in the mess of human life, in the face of rejection and called reception. Well, friends, an assembly is a place of words, words spoken, sung, read, declared. So much has been said. So, as we read this text where the Jesus, the master king and judge, sits on the throne and speaks to sheep and goats, one on the right and one on the left. I think I should not fill you with much many more words. So I have chosen to just end here with words from Katarina von Bora. And I quote, I have read enough. I have heard enough. I know enough. Would to God I lived it out. Amen.